So good morning, everyone. Assalamu alaikum. Um, thank you for the host, uh, for hosting us today to give uh, a presentation about our reserve. And I'm honored to present Dubai Desert Conservation Reserve um, to you guys all. Um, the aim for today's presentation from our side that we will give um, an introduction of the reserve, what is our vision, why we are um, um, interested to work with the um, Ministry of Artificial Intelligence and Office in helping us in protecting nature. But before we go to that deep, we need uh, you to be aware of what is Dubai Desert Conservation Reserve. Not many people are aware that um, Dubai Desert Conservation Reserve is the first protected area in the Emirates of Dubai. We are actually an ICN member and we are sponsored by Emirates Airline. So the whole team of the reserve are Emirates staff. We have a um, very small team uh, with the mean of management and research. Myself as a conservation research manager, Greg Simpkins is a conservation manager and he was one of the oldest, uh, oldest team member. He was here since the start of the uh, Dubai Desert Conservation Reserve. And then our colleague, Maya Chersha as a conservation officer. So I will give you the story from the beginning when the idea came to one um, investor and entrepreneur speaking with His Highness Sheikh Ahmed Saeed uh, Al Maktoum, the, the chairman of Emirates Airline, about making an, an inland desert area as a unique uh, place or um, a good destination for tourism. We all know that desert is highly impacted in the whole of the Arabian Peninsula. It is not only in UAE. And to have an area to look pristine and to attract um, visitors from all over the world, the world, that was the main aim of, of the entrepreneur, the investor, and his highness. So the area started, or the, the idea started by building Al Maha Desert Resort and Spa which is uh, started in March, 1999. And the concept was to give the visitor or the tourism the chance to experience the desert and its unique wildlife and to experience this in their natural environment. So it is not a museum, it's actually you are, whoever visiting uh, the Al Maha Resort experience the real natural environment. It was actually at the beginning only 27 square kilometer, and it's been allocated to Emirates by Dubai government. And the agreement with this to give 5% of the revenues or the turnover of the Al Maha resort to be invested into a varied conservation project. With this start uh, in 1999, there was a small reintroduction release of Arabian Oryx mountain gazelles and sand gazelles. Uh, I'm talking now briefly about this, but we will get later in the lecture talking about these animals and why it's important. And we will get to that later. And then beside the uh, reintroduction of these three very rare species, we established an indigenous trees, forest, shrubs uh, planted in the desert, which providing food and shelter for the animal and even giving a seeds as a seed bank for, uh, for the future. After this establishment, the well establishment of Al Maha in 2001, there was a team of ecologists that they gave a proposal to His Highness Sheikh Mohammed to study the area surrounding this 27 square kilometer of Al Maha resort. And they did the report, uh, auditing report about the, the impact of the human impact over the open desert area and they actually uh, proposed to have a bigger protected area surrounding Al Maha Resort. We were very lucky that His Highness Sheikh Mohammed, uh, the ruler of Dubai, he uh, immediately approved this uh, proposal and then the start of the Dubai Desert Conservation Reserve um, pro um, project started from that date. 
just an, an area that this is uh, the Dubai Emirates. And here we are in this, um, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but here the green color shaded area is Dubai. These are conservation reserve. So you can see from this map that we are actually the south east corner of Emirates of Dubai. We are bordered by Sharjah from the east side. We are bordered by Abu Dhabi from the south, and then we are now here in this corner. In 2001, this was the first biggest land area to be ever given for a single project. And we were very lucky and honored to be among this um, education. So this is another map of DDCR, a detailed map. From now on, I will it, just to make it short, I will call Dubai Desert Conservation Reserve as DDCR. So we actually established with uh, 225 square kilometer, which is it's around 4.7 or 5% of Dubai total land area. We are totally fenced. So the DDCR is completely fenced by the fence line, which uh, um, goes around the whole reserve and it actually measures 92 kilometer perimeter fence. We have uh, security gates, three manned security gates that it give access to visitors, suppliers, and, and tourism as well. And we built at the beginning a water horse for the animal and we put weather station and we got at that time, we got nine tourist camp. From the beginning, we decided that we need to go global as uh, always the vision of His Highness Sheikh Mohammed. So uh, we've been declared by December 17, 2003 uh, by the resolution number 11 as a protected area, the first protected area in Dubai. And then we become a member with uh, UNEP, United Nations Environmental Program, and the other uh, international organization like um, IUCN, which is International Union for Conservation of Nature. We are a member of this organization as well. The vision came to, we said we did lots of discussion about what is the vision of, of, the, of the reserve. So uh, our vision is, to make DDCR as a desert heaven for nature, plus a living heritage for people. So we want to do the balance of protecting nature and keep the heritage for the people as well. So just to talk about the the biggest component, and I will get to that later, about how we actually uh, run and manage this big area in Dubai, even though that at the beginning we've been sponsored by Emirates, but now we are sufficiently running this. It's only because of the tourism component in the DDCR. So we have the luxury resort, which is Al Maha. As I mentioned, it was uh, the beginning of the whole story of the Dubai Desert Conservation Reserves. Plus, we got um, other, uh, what you call it, to uh, tour operators like Arabian Adventure, Platinum, Alpha, Trafco, and Nara, where some of these um, camps or tour operators, they got overnight camps, and most of them, they are doing day visitors. We have some specialized tours like balloon adventures, people who are interested with Falcon. We got Royal Shaheen's activities running here. And even we got what we call it a volunteer tourism where people volunteering to come from all over the world to just come to DCR to share their efforts with our efforts to do our research uh, projects. We decided to run the reserve differently by managing the tour operator. So we are not as open desert where everyone can actually do whatever they like. We have a very strict control over the tourism activities. And if you can see from this map that it's already concentrated in the north of the reserve, that's where we want to keep the rest of the reserve as uh, away from any human conflicts as possible. So what we did is we, dedicated routes, specific routes for each uh, tour operator. And we are not allowing any tour operator to use the other 
company's roots that's to avoid any um, any disturbance for the environment we are giving roads so we are not entertaining any uh, off-road drives uh, within the reserve whoever will come to ddcr need to stick to the road some of the road you will find it on the map a bit wider that's because if it's really soft sand so um, we give some what we call it buffer area for people to just uh, maneuver if they are find it difficult to drive in this soft sand but with the area with its gravel plain or siuh then we make it only one track and we uh, we are giving fines for any body driving of the road maybe lots of people will ask why it's a desert we can drive anywhere it's just like it's a dead place i promise you if you come to ddcr and you see how beauty is the desert without having uh, tracks of cars all over the dunes you will really appreciate um, the real value of the desert. So type of the activities we are giving to the uh, tourists or visitor inside, it's really related to the wildlife. So we have what we call it night safaris where people can actually have the experience of uh, observing the nocturnal animals, the animal that they are active at night and we have nature walks that people can actually walk in the desert and enjoy seeing the tracks of animals, the beauty of the wild plants and etc. We have what we call it wildlife experience where people can actually do some controlled and managed uh, dune drive, but with observing the wild animals in the background. And as traditional practices, we got falconry experiences, which is common in UAE. We got camel trekking, archery, and desert horse riding. So we are trying to keep the activities to be sustainable and not actually uh, impacting the environment. And when we are talking about the overnight camps, we are talking about a very nice uh, sitting area for people to come and enjoy the real unique and pristine desert experience. We get private desert uh, dining and one of the specialized tours is the hot air balloon as well, that it can, we have access to balloon adventure to uh, fly their balloons over the reserve and they can enjoy how beauty the desert from above with the wild animals. We're trying to make sure that all the companies and tour operators are top of the range. So we are keep monitoring their um, um, value in the market, in the tourism market, by using this um, like kind of tools to people evaluating our tourism, evaluating different companies. And from our side, based on the the previous slides, we decided that we need to make a zonation. We need to make areas where we know where is the high impact of tourism. We need to make, uh, we want to make area with medium and we want to keep most of the reserve as wilderness zone. So from this map, you can see that the red area or the red zones is actually what we call it development and uh, recreation zone. And that's mainly where we have here, down here in the middle is Al Maha Resort. And here some areas where people actually do drive. All these straight roads is where uh, tour operator drive through the reserve. So this is uh, management, uh, development and recreation zone. The yellow one is what we call it ecotourism activity zone, where the people can enjoy this medium impacted areas as in part of their ecotourism experience rehabilitation zones where because at the beginning before we put the fence there was actually a camel farms uh, all over the reserve so we converted these farms to look as natural as possible and we call this a rehabilitation zone where we actually rehabilitated the um, the farms and the last one and the most important and the reason we are all here as a team of DDCR, what we call it a wilderness zone. So we are actually trying our best to keep no human intervention in this area. And most of the research and observation purposes are dedicated to this area. And that's where anybody can come and enjoy, um, enjoy the desert and its uh, unique uh, fauna and flora. 
Then we established, we put the fence, we put the zones, we managed the tourism. Then we moved to another stage that started, of course, from the beginning, but we now we have a clear and concrete template of our research and monitoring activities inside DDCR. And that will take us to the end of this lecture explaining why we moved to the artificial intelligence. But I will give you an example of what we are doing of research and monitoring. And uh, my, my friend, he will tell you an example of uh, how we are um, researching the wild animals and moving to towards the artificial intelligence, which is the main uh, objective of this uh, series of lectures. So, Actually, to get to know why we want to do that, the policy we need, we actually, our plan to, to do a sound scientific ecological principle to assist DDCR in the management decisions, because to take a management decision, you need actually a very good baseline data to decide this species is threatened, this species is good, this species is not doing so good, so we need to take interaction, managerial interaction. And by doing research as well, we are adding to the knowledge of the country and of the reason about the species and the habitat of the DCR. And we are trying to promote the DCR as a destination for any applied research uh, activities in that unique hyper arid ecosystem. And the hyper arid ecosystem for, for you who doesn't know the term, it is a very hot and uh, very hot uh, climate zone. And uh, through the national and international academic institution. And we built a research committee because we don't want the decision to be taken only by one person or two person or three person. No, we build our research committee to evaluate any research proposals or any research ideas coming to the DCR and to see how valuable it is to the reserve. So promoting, and again, promoting and facilitating scientific studies. We are giving lo logistical and field support. So we are supporting researchers by coming, staying in DDCR, um, using the DDCR facility to do their own research. And that's actually, of course, solve environmental challenges with collaborative research to the inland hyper arid ecosystem and by building a robust scientific uh, community. We are interested in the, of course, in the country, but we are open our hands for the region and even international students and researchers can come as well and do their research in DDCR. This is very quickly the names of how diverse is our research committee. We have people, uh, scientists from Germany, Australia, Spain, uh, local scientists, and of course, the DDCR team. And this is, again, after that, now we, I need to explain to you the difference between these three pillars. I call this as the three pillars for any activities running in any protected area in the world. You need to have uh, three different activities of surveying, monitoring, and research study. I will speak uh, by each one very quickly. So in any initial assessment for any protected area, you need to have what we call it a baseline survey of the status of the biodiversity. Like if you are going to a new home, you need to know who's your neighbor. So you need to understand what type, what kind of uh, plants are there? What types of animals? What is the endangered? Which one is the more, which one is less? So that's what we call it baseline survey. So in DDCR, we did that at the early beginning. So we got a uh, flora of the DDCR or the plant list of the DDCR. From this plant list, we recorded sedges, grasses, herbs, shrubs, and trees. And that shows you how diverse is the reserve. It is not actually um, uh, abundant of flora. We got the fauna, the three introduced species, which is the Arabian oryx, the sand gazelle, and the Arabian gazelles. But of course, in the open desert, you still, without reintroduction of any new species, you still can see the Arabian hare. Uh, the red fox, the small mammoths like the gerbils, the hedgehogs, and many other different species. So the desert is actually diverse. It is not um, vacant of any animals. We get reptile, 26 reptile species from geckos 
and snakes and other different types of species. Some of the snakes are not harm, harmful and other is a bit venomous snakes. And then we got 140 plus species identified of birds, either resident in DDCR or uh, just crossing over. Then after this baseline, we did our practice of using a tool which called threat analysis. So we studied all the threats inside the reserve and we link it to each species because actually the question we asked that what is the, um, what we call it the site uh, measure values or the site measure values that we need to protect, measure sites value, sorry. So this is a very interesting analysis we did and we came up with seven species that they are the most valuable component of the reserve that we need to take more care about it, like the Arabian oryx, Arabian gazelles, sand gazelles, labbit faced vulture, and Mayad, our uh, my colleague, he will give you more uh, um, discussion. He will give you more explanation about that. Eagle owl, McQueen bustard or Hobara, and the Gordon uh, wildcats. And among the fauna species, we define two habitats that people always ignore the habitat and thinking about the species. No, you need, of course, to consider your unique habitat. Habitat is the mother. If the mother is well, the, the babies will be okay. So we define two habitats, which is the sand sheet and the gravel plains. And one species of, uh, of flora of plants, which is the gaff grooves or the gaff trees. Then we move to the second level of our uh, activities inside the reserve, which is the monitoring. We did a very detailed uh, vegetation studies. And this study, why I define this as a monitoring studies, because it's a repeated studies. So the difference between survey and monitoring, that the monitoring study is a repeated over years. So we have a very detailed study of the vegetation of the reserve, each green uh, dot into that on inside DDCR is uh, what we call it a sampling site where we go there and collect all the different plant species listed into this area. And then a very quick examples of the other um, activities of research, which is the angulate monitoring. And as you see here, we start thinking about make it, uh, making our life easier by using drones. And uh, Moayad will show you again, uh, more interesting uh, outputs from that. We did a very uh, long, uh, like for two years, uh, what we call it uh, orthropods monitoring program. And that's actually lasted for two years. We put insect traps uh, uh, around the trees and around different area in the reserve. Uh, in a way to be able to make a checklist of the insect fauna of the reserve. We are studying the dub holes. So we are doing monitoring for the dub holes. And actually, if there is time, uh, I can explain more, but dub holes is uh, active. It is not just like a hole and it's permanent hole. No, it's, you can find an active dub hole, an inactive dub hole, and even abundant dub hole. So it's a big study that it's repeated over years. We are studying again the fox dens because you see from the, the lizard and the, the foxes, we are studying their homes because this is a very shy animal. So we need to actually monitor their density by, by their activity inside their homes. And then we are studying the Hobara um, bird, the Hobara bustard. And that's by the uh, annual release of the Hobara inside the reserves, and we keep monitoring him and counting him all the year long. And then the camera traps. This is part of the long-term monitoring studies. We are using camera traps to detect animals. So the camera traps idea is that you put a camera with the sensor in an either natural areas or artificial areas. And when I'm saying artificial, I mean uh, water hole, feeding points that where you are putting some uh, advantage for advantage for the animals to come. So for water, animal and birds will come, for feed, animal will come to eat. But also we adding these camera traps to an open desert area to see any animal crossing or birds or whatever. So it's a very simple idea. It's a camera in a box 
that you leave it for a month and you go and collect the same car or the memory card every month and you can leave it for years and it keep working and recording all the uh, the very um, shy animals or bird that you cannot as a by using your human eyes you cannot detect so in this photo below that one you can see this is a very uh, interesting records of the different i think around four different species of the vultures and this is considered to be the first observation in the whole of ue gathering all these different types of vultures in one spot and then away from the camera trap we are using the collar again it's a kind of a technique that you put a collar around the animal necks and then uh, collecting the data later when the collar will fall off and then we this is the third pillar of our studies i will try to be uh, uh, now to move a little bit quicker so we are giving opportunity for students or researchers from outside to come and do their research and even helping us in our long-term monitoring studies so here it's an example of one student from East Anglia University. She wants to study how to trap insects. And she came and he did, she did her study in DDCR. We got a master's student from Sorpon University, Abu Dhabi, who was actually interested to study the Hobara. And uh, we consider it as one of the research study. And then the technology, the UAVs for ecology. We, uh, we, uh, we have an MOU with Zaid University and Love Pro University and Kiel University in UK to study animals by using drones. So now you can feel that AI terms start to come clear now. So we are using unmanned aerial vehicle and by machine learning for biodiversity monitoring and tracking the wild animals. And here is, I'm not an expert in that, but I will give you an example. That's from the, manage, from the management side, that's what we need. We need to detect animal and to get how many of these animals are male and how many of these animals are female. So for example, if you look to the photo on the left, you will find that in this image, the, the, using the AI, we detected four males and six females. So, and of course this project, the aim of this project is to help to identify the different genders and age groups of the oryx population at DDCR using a neural network model. And again, here from uh, a higher altitude, so you can see that because uh, with, the, with the algorithm, now we have some of the accuracy that we detected like 54 oryx, but we didn't uh, detect the gender, but we detected the animal. And in the other photo, we detected 37 using that algorithm. And even we took it to a different level that uh, we all aware that the problem of littering in the desert, that it's something that it's appeared uh, in the sand for years. And then with the sand movement, then you will start find another letters and rubbish again. So to keep DDCR a, a spotless clean reserve, we are using drones actually to fly over areas that we cannot see from, from the, the ground, ground. And, and then, then I detect the, the lettering. And here is another photos you can see from both about the concrete and, and, and uh, uh, other area. Yes, um, here I would like to add also that this littering project to de uh, detect the uh, litter in the desert, it will also help us. It's uh, the pilot stages in DDCR, but we will uh, uh, in the future, uh, there's a plan to apply it in the open deserts, wherever like we have these tires, other litter lying around for years. So that's going to help us also in other areas in Dubai Emirate, in UAE, in different parts, you know, to detect this different type of litters. Yes, thank you, Tamar. Thank you, Marit. So back again to our vision, a desert heaven for nature, a living heritage for people. That's our vision. And I hope that I explained about DDCR and its activities and about it. So um, now we will just um, have um, a video, a short video that we would like actually to share with you, showing you our activities using drones uh, to study uh, wildlife. I will stop sharing my screen now. Let me stop. 
and my uh, colleague Mayed, uh, he will start the video. Thanks for pairing with us for a second. Okay, Maya, will start now. So this is one of the videos we took for uh, near uh, our uh, feeding uh, spot in DDCR where we want to count the animal numbers to estimate their population in DDCR and to, uh, to see that how much animals should stay in the reserve according to the reserve carrying capacity and the animals which we need to move them or translocate them to other protected areas. As we can see that there are the the vehicle, the track is on the right side, but most of the uh, most the searchers are on the right side or vehicle. Uh, they cannot see the animals behind the tune, but the drone can detect it. The Arabian oryx are not at all, maybe you can see from this video, are bothered with the drone. There's no effect on the behavior of the drone with even flying like 15 or 20 meters above the animals. I will share uh, another short video. The animals can be seen around the feeding point. So normally during the count, you will see only these animals around the feeding station. But with these, the help of the drones, you have a wider angle and you can see from up, you can count the animals. These all other animals, even if they are like behind the dunes or far from the...
So thank you, Mayat, for uh, for these two videos. I just like want to ask Masab. We have uh, another presentation, but I think the time ran very fast. So um, do you want to to add your site here from the AI using AI for camera traps? I can talk uh, very briefly about the camera traps, and then if we ha still have time, you can uh, share your presentation. Uh, uh, Masab, I can put some pictures from the camera trap if you want. Yeah, go yeah. ahead, please. Yeah, and then... Uh, yeah, Masab. These are the few um, examples of the camera traps. Um, how we use, or how these, how best these camera traps can be used. So these, uh, like for example, the camera traps uh, studies are always for the rare and um, rare and nocturnal species, which cannot be seen during the daytime. You can see the Arabian here. Uh, in this picture, so we recorded it during uh, from the camera trap picture. You can see the timing, and you can see the um, uh, the date and the timing. It's uh, eleven thirty uh, p.m. in the night, and we can see like two individuals in this picture from the camera traps. Uh, this is another uh, one of our site uh, value species, as Samir said, the Arabian wildcat. Uh, to be really honest, during the day times or during the last three years, we have cited it only once uh, uh, during the surveys. But with the camera traps, uh, there are locations that we often cited. It's a very shy species and nocturnal species. Uh, the red fox. Um, it's another uh, important species for the Dubai Desert Conservation Reserve. It's again mostly active during the night time, and you can um, you can see it mostly uh, during the night time. But with the camera traps, we really got a very good data about the behavior, about the uh, feeding ecologies, and these things. Uh, the vultures. It's uh, the um, we have four species of uh, vultures in DDCR, and DDCR is one of the um, uh, one of the few sites in UAE that we got at one time. We have recorded more than forty nine vultures, but we don't see them normally uh, during the uh, during the surveys. But it's quite um, it's quite common with the camera traps to record them, and we record it at one time with one camera trap more than twenty nine uh, vultures. The, especially the leopard-faced vulture. This is again a picture of the wildcat, oryx, and Arabian uh, Arabian uh, red fox. Uh, the sand gazelle, one of our main uh, site value species. Again, another vulture, leopard-faced vulture. The Asian hobara. Uh, recorded in one of the plantage, uh, plantation areas in the farm. It's a very uh, shy species. It's quite difficult to detect the hubara in the desert. And you can see hubara with, uh, um, with the oryx. Uh, this is a group of oryx on a water point where we put the camera and you can see a, one, a young uh, calf of oryx, which is only a few days old, is with the group. Another red fox and a group of sand gazelles and Arabian gazelles in the back near the water point. So you know also like how they live with the camera traps. We can know how they how is their so social structure for the species and another um, uh, oryx, young calf, oryx calf. A group of oryx, which is uh, which is coming to the water point in the night. Mostly, people think, or even the researchers, they use, assume that they are more active during the daytime. But in the summer, they can also come during the nighttime to the feed uh, to the feeding stations and water point. 
uh, Arabian Red, uh, Arabian Ghazal. Another picture of the oryx during the night time. That's it, Masad. Yeah, uh, if you allow me, Marwa, I can sure. uh, part, partly uh, reply to that question. Sure. So yes, sure. we are working with the AI office on the different species, and we started working on the Arabian oryx. Uh, so we are working on two, uh, through this, uh, we are, um, we are working on this algorithms, creating these algorithms with, uh, you know, like huge data of pictures and videos to train the algorithm to detect the animals for Arabian oryx and for, we started it with Arabian oryx and then we are moving to the other species. So each species, at least like we have to do it with a thousand pictures in the beginning and then we need to see the percentage of uh, uh, the detection. We give a, give it a test and then we see with it. So it's, we can do it from the camera traps from the, and we can do it with, uh, we can do it with the camera traps. We can do it with the uh, drones, but we are more interested from our side with drones uh, at this stage for the oryx as it will give us the counts and things like that. Yeah, Masab is there. Maybe he can reply partly for... What's the question? Uh, yes, Marwa. Yeah, um, so they were asking um, if, uh, if these cameras are uh, detecting the and identifying animals the same way that uh, computer vision works with object detection, and then how um, how do you deploy machine learning and the data that you gather? What what are the insights that you are trying to get? Okay, sure. So these camera traps, as uh, Tamar explained, uh, they remain in their place for months or even uh, a full year. And then after that period, long period of time, uh, uh, the team will go and collect the data from the memory card. And uh, there will be a large amount of images. Um, they could reach 100,000 uh, thousand images. And for the team at the uh, conservation reserve uh, to, to, to analyze what animals are present in these images, uh, it's, it's very tough to do it manually. So the objective is to streamline this process. Once the images are collected from the camera traps, uh, the, the AI model will be used to automatically sort, sort all the images uh, based on the species present in each image. And that will help the team there to analyze uh, which species are present in which location. So that's the objective, to streamline the process of collecting the data from the camera traps to reaching the, the conclusion. And, uh, Regarding the uh, which AI models are used, uh, they are very similar to the common object detection models, but they are trained to work specifically on the species that are uh, that are present in the in the reserve. So uh, one of the question is, I will I would like to reply for some. Uh, it says, why do some of the touring companies have longer routes for the tourism for tourism in the day than others. So actually, uh, it looks on the map that the tours or the routes are short, but to be really honest, for some some of the routes, it's, uh, it's not short, it's just in parts. So all the companies which are operating in DDCR have the same length of routes because, uh, yeah, the buffers will be different. Uh, uh, buffer means these routes which were on the map, they have some buffers where they can go in the off the track only in very few places where there is a very minimal uh, impact on the environment. That's only allowed it in the soft dunes, you know, in the gravel plains and uh, uh, other parts where there is some effects or impacts. So we don't allow that. That's why you see that in some parts we take it in parts for that companies, you know. But anyway, for our companies, the route of the route will be the length of the route will be same so you are welcome to choose any company among them you know and then also it's like for some companies like nara they are more uh, uh, like towards the food than the uh, than the tours so if you want to take uh, tours for wildlife drives and things like that on the website on our ddcr website you can see there is ddcr approved tours so you can go for that once I hope I answered the question. And then uh, 
there is one uh, question saying how uh, how frequent you conduct a survey in, for the for the species so it's different in the reserve for example for the arabian oryx or the ungulate species the oryx and gazelles we have weekly count um, and uh, that's a long term we need to we need to assess the population and to manage it accordingly for feeding for moving out the animals and things but for some species like the small mammals or the carnivores uh, we have different criteria for small members we do it twice a year just to assess like how their population is doing and vegetation surveys are like once in three years uh, it's uh, all def uh, depends like uh, what we need out of it like how what results we need from it you know and we have like the camera traps is an ongoing monitoring program it is there as masab explained that these camera traps are there for like i think for the last three years we didn't move them now we just change the we just maintain them we do the maintenance we just change the memory cards and then give the data to the ai to help us you know in helping us instead of going one by one the picture uh, each picture thousands of pictures that's ai role to go through it and for each species you know that's what we are working with ai for that yeah, please. Uh...